Helps if the mute is off. Open up your Bibles to Jonah, the book of Jonah, your Old Testament, the minor prophet. We have been making our way through, uh, bit by bit, through the book of Jonah. We're going to go through chapter 3 this morning, and then next week we will finish up the book of Jonah, uh, finish up chapter 4, and then Scott will take us back into Romans, and we will be back in Romans in chapter 5. But this morning we're going to be in chapter 3 of Jonah. Jonah, to say the least, things up to this point have not been going well for Jonah, the prophet of the Lord. And we know that the word of the Lord comes to Jonah, and Jonah's response is to flee the presence of the Lord. That's what we saw in chapter 1. And Jonah finds himself on a ship, and the Lord brings his loving discipline to Jonah by the means of a terrible wind, a great wind. He hurls a great wind, the Lord does, and Jonah is in the middle of the storm in the sea. He's thrown overboard. He wants to die. He asked for this. He's thinking he will die. And God, in his mercy and his compassion, appoints a great fish to swallow Jonah as the means of salvation, right? The fish wasn't the discipline. Being thrown overboard into the sea was the discipline. And God appointed this fish as a means of rescue for Jonah. And Jonah is finding throughout this story that being religious is not enough. Simply one's heritage is not enough. Simply reciting a creed and knowing things about God from your childhood is not enough. And knowing or being able to recite specific truths, as Jonah does in chapter 1, about God is not enough. The one who should know better in this book as the prophet of God is the one who is not doing so well. And that's kind of the point of Jonah, Not for Jonah's sake, but for God's sake, because of what it puts on display about God. And we see that there is a warning for a wayward people in this book by looking at a wayward prophet. Now, I do believe that Jonah was a true prophet of God, that he's an Old Testament believer. The word of the Lord came to him. It was a true word from God. He was a true prophet. He's used by God as the human means to author inspired scripture. And Jesus himself acknowledges Jonah as a true prophet of God. Yet his own heart as a believer, like us, is wayward. It's prone to wander. We will all would attest to the fact that simply because we're Christians doesn't mean we sin no more. We don't continue on sinning, but we sin. We sin. The story of Jonah demonstrates that, and the reality of the matter is that we are far more like Jonah than we we probably care to admit. It's easy on this side of things to look at Jonah and to hold over him judgment over his poor decisions and over his rebellion and over his desire to flee from the Lord. And that's really the main picture that we get regarding Jonah from Scripture. But that's just a snapshot into his life. And isn't it... Isn't it kind of the Lord that people don't just get one snapshot of our life? But the story of Jonah isn't predominantly about Jonah. It's not for us to study Jonah himself. It's for us to learn things about God. And Jonah is a peripheral part of the picture that God puts forth in his word to display his character and his nature and his love and his compassion and his grace and his means of bringing about salvation towards those who don't deserve it and his means of loving discipline for his children who also don't deserve it. You see, the story of Jonah is not simply a story of a wayward prophet, but of a compassionate God. The story of Jonah is a rescue story by a compassionate God who won't let a prophet get away and will, who will step into the lives of pagan sailors who don't expect it and, and will even bring a whole city to repentance while faithfully stepping into the life of an unfaithful prophet. The book of Jonah highlights God and his grace, God and his patience, God and his mercy, God and his righteousness, God and his love, God and his compassion. Jonah is a part of demonstrating that on several levels. 
Jonah is the means of bringing God's word to the people of Nineveh, yet he himself is repulsed at the idea of going to a people like the Ninevites, right? A pagan people. They were not Israelites. The people in Nineveh were not Israelites. They were Assyrians, And who can blame Jonah for being repulsed by this? The Ninevites were were morally debased. The Ninevites were notoriously wicked, and as Assyrians, they were the perpetual enemies of Israel. And, And I want you to think for a moment of the most revolting, the most violent, the most barbaric people, people who murder at will and sacrifice their own children, who on top of this, they are entangled with the most gross immorality. And the Lord says, I want you to go to those people. What would you say? What would you do? Jonah does not want to go, but thankfully God does not bend his will to man's will, but rather God bends man's will to his purposes, and he does that through loving and severe discipline of Jonah. And in our chapter today, we see a story of grace that follows this story of gracious discipline, a story of second chances in chapter 3 of Jonah. We see supernatural, unparalleled grace administered in a loving display of care and unmerited kindness. All grace is a second chance. And third, and fourth, and fifth. Wherever grace exists, it is there because God has chosen to show mercy and to give another chance, to give to you something that you do not deserve, something that you have not earned another chance. He has not held you to what you deserve. And in Jonah's case here, I don't believe that what we see in his life is salvific grace. It's not saving grace. As I already stated, I believe he's already a believer. It's not that. If he just gets his life together, then God will save him. And God's giving him a second chance to get his life together. That's not what's going on here. That's never how salvation works. Salvation never works on you messed up once and so try to do right again and that's the kind of second chance that you get. The the salvation in scripture is a second chance to turn away from yourself and to turn to Christ as the only hope of salvation and forgiveness of your sins. God is showing patient grace and mercy and compassion to one of his own here who is walking in disobedience. There is saving grace that takes place in this story that is amazing and awesome shown to Nineveh. Again, not to get their act together to deserve God, but to turn to him in repentance and faith. Yet the grace that Jonah experiences is one that highlights how great God's saving grace is that it isn't undone in a moment of rebellion and how amazing God's sanctifying grace is that brings us back through loving discipline. Did you hear that? This grace that God demonstrates to Jonah that he experiences, it highlights how great God's saving grace is because it's not undone in a moment of rebellion. Isn't that good news? What God is, if you're a follower of Jesus, what God has done in your life to save you cannot be undone by a moment of weakness because it never had to do with what we did. It's all about what Christ did. And yet at the same time, his sanctifying grace is put on display as he steps into a wayward prophet's life, into a rebellious servant's life, and lovingly brings discipline so that he will then come under God's authority and obey God's instruction. You may currently be running from God and his instruction in his word, walking in continual disobedience. And maybe you're defiant, Maybe you're deceived. Maybe you're content to have your life be on the fringe of commitment to the Lord. You've you've counted some of the costs of which you're willing to let go to follow God, but there are some things in your life you have not yet wanted to let go of or things you have been reluctant to fully embrace that God calls you to. 
Maybe you've been justifying your disobedience to yourself. Well, I, I know God's word says to do this, but you don't understand. It's, it's, it's a really full season. It's, it, things are really hard right now, or this is going on in my life, or this person did this to me. And so, yeah, I'll move that direction, but I'm not quite ready because of fill in the blank. Maybe you're fighting for obedience and you're just disheartened in your sin. You keep running back to that which you hate and you can't even figure it out. Why do I keep doing this? Listen, there is grace for you both to forgive you and both to enable you to no longer walk in that sin. And in the message of Jonah, we see a message of hope. See a message of hope, and it flows out of a right understanding of the love of God, a right understanding of the grace of God, his compassion. Everyone here who is a believer of Christ has had this kind of grace from the Lord, has needed that kind of grace, or currently needs this kind of grace to help us see our sin, to help us flee our sin. Everyone needs grace. Not one of us here wants what we deserve. I don't want what I deserve. And I hear many of you say, I'm better than I deserve because you have loved and embraced this reality of God's kindness to you in your life that, that is something that you know you just didn't do anything to deserve that. But there's a temptation for each one of us to think that we deserve things that we don't, right? Have you ever thought this way? I I so don't deserve this right now. I so don't deserve this. Maybe those words have even come out of your mouth. I I don't deserve this in my marriage. I I, I don't deserve this with my kids. I don't deserve this from my employer. I, I don't deserve this from fill in the blank, anything. But if we got what we deserved, we wouldn't even be here this morning. In Jonah chapter 3, we get an amazing picture of God's undeserved, unparalleled grace. And every single one of us needs it. We need that grace. So let's look together at Jonah chapter 3. We're going to go through all of chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Jonah 3, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord, or the word of Yahweh, came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of Yahweh, or according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God. And they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. He issued a proclamation and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water, but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn. And relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Let's pray. God, what an amazing picture of your unparalleled grace in so many ways. 
Lord, I pray that you would use your word this morning to corral our affections from lesser things to the greatest of all, which is you. Lord, reveal sin in our lives where we must see it. Give to us courage to fight sin and to walk in obedience where we need to. And Lord, we pray that you would be honored and that you would use your word in the lives of your people as we know you love to do. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the unparalleled graciousness of God is revealed in our chapter in three responses. The the unparalleled graciousness of God is revealed in three responses. In Jonah chapter 3, we get insight into three responses to various circumstances that put on display the unique, the amazing, the powerful grace of God. And this is God's willingness to extend something good to those who don't deserve it. That's the grace of God here, that he is extending something good. He is giving a gift to those who don't deserve it. So the first response that demonstrates God's unparalleled graciousness is Jonah's obedient response. Jonah's obedient response. We see that in the first four verses. We see Jonah's obedient response here. Jonah finally responds in obedience to God. And the book started with God's word coming to Jonah and Jonah wanting to flee God. In fact, he did flee from the presence of the Lord. And now God's word comes to Jonah a second time in verse 1 of chapter 3. And in verse 3, Jonah responds in obedience. Look again at verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And then verse 3, so Jonah arose and went. Before, the word of the Lord came to Jonah and he walked in disobedience. He fleed from the Lord and now he arises and he goes. And and this isn't a testimony to Jonah finally getting things together. God graciously restores Jonah. This is a testimony of God's grace, grace towards Jonah and his patience to Jonah or with Jonah. This is a second chance for Jonah. He doesn't deserve it, and yet this is consistent with who God is. We see God working in such a way all throughout Scripture where he gives those who don't deserve it second chances and third and fourth and fifth oftentimes. You see, there's no level of graciousness that even competes with God's graciousness. No one one is more worthy of being submitted to, and no offense of rebellion is greater than that which is committed against such a holy and righteous God. And yet, God is patient. There's no greater divide between the master and the servant than God and us. And yet he forgives. And he's patient. And he's gracious. He is long-suffering. He is abounding in grace and mercy. It was shocking and truly amazing, as we discussed the first week in Jonah, that the word of the Lord would come to Jonah one time. Jonah should have been floored. He should have been leveled. He should have been brought to utter worship of God and obedience to him that God would have his word come to him at all. Yet Jonah disobeyed and ran from God. And God graciously comes to Jonah again. Jonah did not merit the privilege that it is to be a servant of the Lord. He did not possess some extraordinary skill that God needed to tap into. It it is amazing grace that Jonah is hearing this a second time. It was shocking that the word of the Lord came to Jonah the first time and that God, Yahweh God, the God who created the heavens and the earth as Jonah refers to him in chapter one, the one who spoke creation into existence and breathed life into dust, the the eternally existing, all-powerful, all-knowing God has his sovereign will, his plan, his purposes, and that he would invite into this Jonah is truly amazing. That he would condescend and and come to a self-righteous, sinful man who represents a wayward people to carry his truth as a means to accomplishing his purposes is truly amazing. 
It takes amazing to a whole new level that this God would come one time and give one chance is kindness beyond measure. But then for God to come again, after being rebelled against and ran from, that he would come to Jonah a second time, just when you think that God couldn't be any more gracious, he extends more grace. Jonah was at the verge of death. He almost died. He should have been dead. He wanted to be dead, yet God did not give him what he deserved because God loves Jonah. And God loves the people he wants to save. And God is on a mission to save. And in his graciousness, he has chosen to involve Jonah in his purposes. What a grace. What a grace. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. God has his message and he desires it to be brought to the Ninevites. God loves his word and God is determined to get his message across to those who need it. And even a disobedient prophet will not stand in the way of the Lord rescuing the lost. This is how God works. This is what he does. If you study church history, what you will see is that time after time after time, God uses imperfect men and women for the glory of his name to communicate his message. Everyone is an imperfect messenger who did wonderful things, but if you look closely or not even too close, you'll see that there are some very ugly things in their lives, right? Because they sin against a holy God. We all do. They, like us, are sinners, and God uses them in spite of their sin. And we are never to be content in our sin. It's not that that truth should make us feel comfortable with our sin. It's okay. God will use me anyway. That's not biblical thinking. That is not God-honoring thinking. We are to vigorously pursue holiness out of love for God. We are repenters. That's what it means to be a Christian. You turn away from yourself and you turn to God. You no longer love what is offensive to God. You love what is pleasing to God. That's, that's what it means to be a Christian, one saved by grace to that. We are repenters, but we take heart knowing God loves his word and he is faithful even when we are not. God loves to have his word proclaimed. And he uses imperfect messengers to proclaim his perfect message. Here the word of the Lord comes to Jonah and it takes him almost drowning in the sea and being rescued by a fish to submit his life to the instruction of the Lord. Do you realize that having your Bible... Having your Bible is to have the living God, the creator of all things, speaking directly into your life. It's easy to hold judgment over Jonah about his running from God in light of his word coming to him. What is the pattern of your response and your bringing your heart before God's word look like? Do you eagerly submit your life to it? Do you view your Bible as an immeasurable grace from God to you? You're not left to yourself. You're not left to the wisdom and inventions of men. You're not left to man's counsel. People talk about things that shape their lives, people that shape their lives, events that shape their lives. How much more the word of God, the words that come from the very mouth of God given to us be shaping our lives. We need to think about this more often. Every day we have the privilege. It is not a Christian burden to wake up and read your Bible. It is an immense privilege that we have God's word and we get to bring our hearts to it, our hearts which are prone to wander, prone to leave the God that we love, prone to be wayward, prone to idolatry. We get to bring those hearts that we possess to God's word. 
to renew our hearts, to renew our minds, to see him, to see what he's like, to see what he loves, to see how he acts, to see his instructions, which are good for us, for our good. Yet often we neglect, we make excuses, we let ourselves get consumed with temporal things, and we neglect God's word in our lives. We need to remind one another, right? I need, that. I need this. I need you to remind me. God doesn't leave us there. He didn't leave Jonah there. Jonah sought to flee from God and God brought a storm and a fish to swallow him. And if that's what it takes to trust the Lord, to obey and to follow the Lord, to submit to his word, and if that's what it takes, then so be it. That's a tough prayer to pray. That's a, that's a tough prayer to pray. Are you ready to pray that prayer? God, whatever it takes for me to walk in obedience and love and submission, bring it into my life. Hardship, if it'll make me love you more, bring it. S sickness, if, if it'll make me love you more, please God, bring it into my life. Loss of job, if it will make me please my Savior better. Bring it into my life. God, help me that if I stray, if I rebel, if I run, if I sin, if I neglect your word, please do whatever it takes to bring me back to you. Whether or not we are ready to pray that prayer reveals a lot about what we think about the goodness of God. Do you believe that God is really for you, that he loves you, that he loves to give good gifts to his children, that he's working all things according to his good pleasure and his glory and his will for the good of his people? Because if you really believe that, if we really believe that, there is no earthly circumstance that we will want to run from because we will understand that every earthly circumstance God is sovereign over and using to conform us more into the image of his son, James 1. And so we will consider it joy. Sickness, there's joy in Christ. So sorrow and death, but there is joy in Christ. Trial, joy in Christ. Hardship, there is joy in Christ. And this is God's love for us in our lives that he would do this to us. Hebrews 13, you know it. The Lord disciplines those he loves. We should long for that kind of loving discipline in our lives. Psalm 119, 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, I keep your word. Psalm 119, verse 71. It is good for me that I was afflicted that I may learn your statutes. That's the grace of God. So God's word comes to Jonah a second time. And then in verse three, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. And then verse four, then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk and he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now three times Nineveh has been described as a great city. And here in verse three, we see it described as an exceedingly great city. This might refer to the size of the city. It might refer to the importance or the influence that the city had on the region. Some believe it's a reflection of the importance of this city to God. And to a degree, all of those options are true. What we do know is that God has a message to bring to this city. And Jonah is called to go and to bring this message on God's behalf. And it is a three-day walk, which is most likely referring to the amount of days it would take for Jonah to walk around the city and deliver God's message. 
It's how much time it would take for him to go throughout the city and the suburbs and to proclaim this message that God had given to him. And so Jonah is going to go all over the city, and this would happen over a three days journey. Jonah is on a mission, and on his first day's journey, this is what he says, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. You see that at the end of verse 3. This is a very short sermon. You might be thinking, must be nice. <laughs> For 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. In the Hebrew text, this is only five words. Five words in the Hebrew text that Jonah is to communicate, and the people respond in a big way, and they respond in a way that only God could do in people. And he says, 40 days Nineveh will be overthrown. This is a general term here, to be overthrown. It meant to be sacked or destroyed, but it could also mean a, a change of heart. Something big is coming in your life, a, a transformation, a change that is going to take place. And in 40 days, things are going to change and be turned upside down in Nineveh. And this is true. Whether it's destroyed or brought to repentance, the Lord is going to bring about radical transformation in this city. And while Jonah's message is a message of judgment, there is grace even in it. God gives them 40 days to heed his word, to repent. God didn't have to do that. He didn't have to give them that time. He could have brought an unannounced judgment upon them right then and there, that, and, and yet he didn't. It was gracious of God. It was exceedingly patient of God. And Jonah's message here is a message of judgment, and yet there's grace. And we see, as we will see in a moment, God uses that message of judgment in an extraordinary way in the lives of the people of the city. Jonah brings news of their sin to them. And in this book of Jonah, we see that this is actually an effective approach. This is an approach that God is pleased to use to talk about sin. There's something for us to notice here. You see, graciousness isn't neglecting the topic of sin. It's not being gracious to not talk about sin with one another or with our neighbors or with our coworkers or unbelieving friends. Graciousness isn't neglecting the topic of sin. It's not downplaying sin. The message God gives Jonah shows the seriousness of the situation. There is nothing kind about downplaying sin. You have a 105 degree fever, but let me tell you why it's not that bad. No, you're burning up. There's nothing kind, there's nothing gracious about making sure you build a relationship and grow your friendship before you get to the point of bringing up sin. Where in our Bibles would tell us, have a worldly type friendship with somebody as the foundation to then bring the good news of the gospel into their life? Nothing would instruct us towards that. There are men and women who are dying. They're going to hell. They're under God's wrath and judgment. What in the world would we wait for to tell them that they have offended a righteous, holy, good God? How we do that, that's everything. The kind of heart we do that with, that's everything. But there must be a message communicating the fact that they have sinned against God. We sinned against God. We had to know that. We had to have someone speak that truth into our lives. If you don't think anything is wrong with you or that you have done anything against a holy God, then what good is the death and sacrifice of his son? You don't think you owed anything, you don't think there was an offense. Oh, but if you see the reality of that offense, how huge it is, how severe it is because of the holiness of God and the reality of our own hearts and disposition towards him, oh, now there's grace. Now I can see grace as it is. God is so gracious to bring a message of judgment to these people.
people must understand the bad news before they can fully see the good news of the gospel. The message of Jonah shows that God is not ignorant of sin. He does not tolerate sin, yet God is exceedingly gracious in our sin. There is hope. There is hope. Who could possibly save the Ninevites? No one but God. God can, and he did it by his word being brought to them, and God hasn't changed. He still loves to save the worst of sinners using his word. God gave Jonah a message to take to Nineveh, and God has given us a message. If you are a Christian, God has given you a message to take to the world. Make disciples. What does that look like in your life? Are you making disciples? Are you proclaiming the gospel? Are you in love sharing the truth of God's word and God's message that there is forgiveness for all who repent, who turn from their sins, who turn to God in faith and repent and believe that Jesus' substitutionary work on the cross, his taking the place and taking the wrath of God that we deserve in our sin is the only hope for forgiveness of sins. We are called to proclaim that message, every one of us. It doesn't matter our background. It doesn't matter how young in the Lord we are, how old we are in the Lord, how mature we are, how immature we are. We need to be proclaiming the message of the gospel. You see, what what Team P&G is doing, the Cans and the Dodds participation and the Laymans and the Mitchells and Amelia, they are not doing second-level Christianity. They're not doing what special super Christians, different from the rest of us, do. Sure, there's various giftedness within the body of Christ that we're to exercise. But they are doing basic Christianity, but they are doing basic Christianity really, really, really well. We should all aspire to proclaiming the gospel in whatever arena, in whatever ways that we can. You can do that in your homes, with your children, with your family members. You can do that in your neighborhoods, in your gyms, in your coffee shops, in your jobs, in your schools. God's method for changing hearts is still the preaching of his message, and we know what his message is in our Bibles. It's the gospel. Jonah comes walking in, most likely skin bleached from being in the belly of the fish, and what's going to convince them? Not Jonah's appearance, not his eloquence. It's God opening hearts as they hear God's message. What a grace of God to bring Jonah to this point and to use him in this way. God's unparalleled graciousness is revealed in Jonah's obedient response. Number two, the second response that reveals God's unparalleled graciousness is Nineveh's repentant response. Nineveh's repentant response. In verses 5 through 9, we see that God graciously grants repentance, and this only comes from God. There is a change that only God can bring to hearts. Jonah brings this message of judgment, 40 days and you will be overthrown, and then verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed in God. And let this just bolster your courage for evangelism. Take courage. Let this bolster your courage and zeal for evangelism and confidence that God can and God does save in extraordinary ways. Have you ever known someone that you wrote off as unsavable? I mean, God could save them, I guess, but I I just don't think he ever will. Jonah's message is five words, but it was God's message and the people respond and believe. In verse 5, we see that the people of Nineveh believed in God. In Luke eleven thirty two, 32, we see even more specifically as Jesus affirms that the people of Nineveh repented at hearing the message of Jonah. They repented. That is, they changed their mind and heart and a pursuit to sin, to away from sin and toward God. And this is something that only God can awaken in the hearts of men. Repentance is the gracious opportunity to spit out the bitter taste of sin, 
Through repentance, God opens eyes to see that there is more than feasting on the same filth day after day for the rest of your life. And this transformation reached every class of Nineveh. Do you see that in verse 5? From the greatest to the least, and then verse 6, the word reached the king. God can even change the hearts of dictators and kings. The king laid aside his robe and put on sackcloth. This is shocking. This is amazing what is taking place in the heart of this king as sackcloth was an outward way or demonstration of showing that you are not your own and that you are sick of who you are, and it would show one of humble estate. The one who would typically wear this is the beggar. The king lays aside his robe, that which signifies his throne and his royalty, his authority, and puts on sackcloth, which signifies humility before God. The pagan heart of this king is moved to worship God, and he desires this for his people as well. God can do this. God does this. In verse 7, he issues a proclamation to put an end to pagan worship going on in Nineveh. Look at verse 7. Do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. This is likely referring to the pagan sacrificial rituals involving food and animals. It was a way of life for these people of idolatry and pagan idol worship. And he's putting a hard stop on the pagan worship that is taking place in Nineveh. And then in verse 8, it's not enough to just leave pagan rituals behind. He calls each one to turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Not only how you worship, who you worship, but how you live your life as well is to be impacted by the Lord. And when God invades someone's life, it reaches every part of that life. Nothing is left unaffected by the work of God. And in verse 9, we see an interesting statement by the king that reveals a lot. He says, who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. The king here understands that they fully deserve God's anger and wrath, and that is a people they deserve to be destroyed, to perish. He understands this. Yet they are doing all of this not with the thought that the automatic response is that God will not bring judgment upon them. If we only do this, then God won't do this. They are not earning God's favor. And then because they have changed, he would then have to turn away his wrath. They don't know. They don't know what God will do. They know what they deserve. The king understands what he deserves. They know they don't deserve his grace. They understand that God is worthy of worship, that they have sinned against him. They understand they deserve God's wrath and that he would be fully justified to bring it upon them. Yet they are hoping God might relent. But it is a real possibility that God would judge them and do so rightly. They have repented, but they are not demanding anything from God. They are still looking to him and his character and entrusting themselves under his judgment. Sure, they would rather not be destroyed, but they understand there's nothing about them that deserves to not be destroyed. They know what they deserve, and they know that their only hope is in the grace and compassion of God. The fact that they see this from top to bottom, that they have repented and fear Yahweh, is such a testimony to his unparalleled grace. A whole city from top to bottom repents and turns to Christ. Again, this should bolster our courage for what God loves to do through those who faithfully bring his message This has been helpful for me to help just recalibrate and bolster my own prayers for our friends in Papua New Guinea. God saves a whole city from the highest class to the lowest class. He can save a whole tribe, a whole region, a whole island. 
Lastly, God's unparalleled graciousness is number three, put on display through God's relenting response. God's relenting response. We saw Jonah's obedient response. We saw Nineveh's repentant response. And now we're going to see God's relenting response in verse 10, where God graciously relents. Verse 10, when God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. God would have been fully justified to bring calamity upon Nineveh. He was ready to do so. He had his message proclaimed that in their sinfulness, that was what was coming to them. Yet they responded in genuine repentance, and God relents. He saw the outward expression of the inward change that had come about within them, and he knew both as he knows everything and every intention of every heart, and God's grace came upon them, and his wrath was lifted. When grace comes, it fills up the person in a way that wrath is removed. When when grace enters a life and saves that person, it does so in a way that wrath is removed. The grace of God saturates the whole. It's like putting a drop of food coloring in a cup of water, clear to blue in one drop. It saturates all of it. Or when you're in a room and several conversations are taking place and then a person, that person, comes into the room who is so joyful and so fun to be around and the whole room fills with joy and vibrance. That is the nature of grace. When grace comes into a person's life, it radically transforms everything around it and removes the wrath that was once there. It's light entering darkness. All darkness is gone. Not all sin is yet gone. It will be one day, but all wrath is removed. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And God's relenting response was so gracious, he saw their deeds. What were their deeds? How they turned from their wicked way. He saw their repentance. He saw their repentance and he relented. And what a gracious God. Their turning from their wickedness didn't merit God's grace. It's not that their good deeds outweighed their bad, so God relented. God saw that at a heart level, there was change, which only comes about when God invades a person's life and heart. God saw their repentance and in his grace, he relents. Does this mean that God somehow changed his mind or compromised his integrity because now he didn't do what he said he was going to do? He said 40 days and he would overthrow the city. Well, of course not. God does not lie. God, through Jonah, brings an announcement of judgment that is given, but upon repentance, God's judgment is withheld. That is grace. That is grace. That is how God works. God does not turn away his wrath because he is weak or lacks integrity somehow, but because he is gracious and loving and patient and righteous and just. Again and again, we see in the Bible that God is so patient. He is relenting. He is steadfast in his dealing with sinners. He is so gracious. In the book of Jonah, we see God can save anyone. From pagan sailors to a wayward prophet to a whole city from top to bottom. It is only by his power that one can be saved and his power can save anyone. This is our confidence. This is why we can and must proclaim to everyone, God can save you from your sins. Listen, if you're not a follower of Jesus... God can save you from your sins. There is nothing that you have committed, no public sin, no secret sin that you have done. There's no amount of sins that you can sin that God's grace cannot invade your life and remove his wrath from your life because that's how amazing the blood of his son is. He loves to save.
Not everyone will respond to our message this way that we see in Nineveh. It is in God's hands, but we must be faithful. We must proclaim the message that God has given us. We must be faithful, gracious proclaimers of God's gospel. Nahum proclaimed God's message a hundred years after Jonah to Nineveh again. Jonah's generation had died and pagan worship was back among the people and they didn't respond to Nahum's message. God is in control. We need to be faithful, walking in obedience, knowing the power of God's message, knowing God can save pagan sailors and he can restore wayward prophets and he can save whole cities from top to bottom. He can save you. Christian, if you've been walking in unrepentant sin, running from God, neglecting his word in your life, he can restore you. He can restore you. That's grace. It's God's compassion. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. There are times when we get insight into your character and your word and I wish there were better words to describe gratitude and thanks and awe because you, you are like no other. Your love, that, as we heard Jake speak about during our time in the Lord's table together, that would sacrifice very own son as the payment for our sin. What blessing, what kindness, what grace. Lord, guard us from neglecting your word. Guard us from unrepentance. Guard us from loving sin more than you. Guard us from being deceived. Guard us from pride. Guard us from idolatry. Help us to love you, to pursue you, to worship you, to live for you. Thank you for your church. Thank you that we're not left to ourselves in this and that we can sharpen and encourage and spur one another on in this. Help us to grow in these things. Help us to have courage to speak truth and love. Help us to have humility to receive admonishment. Help us to take sin seriously. Help us to glorify your son. We pray all these things in his name. Amen.